Today I want to show you what orchids I have that have to tolerate temperatures of 5 degrees Celsius. And look, they bloom! It's good to have you here. Thank you so, so much for clicking on the video. I am in southern Spain, believe it or not, but considering the conditions, you would think I was somewhere up in the north of Europe. Well, not quite. I better not complain. Anyway, it's a very, very cold day and most of my orchids are inside, but I have a few that can tolerate lower temperatures. They have to tolerate lower temperatures because the real estate inside is relatively precious. And there are other orchids that need it warmer than anything I can really seriously provide out here. So while everything I'm gonna show you today does prefer to have it a little bit warmer, this is what they're dealt with. Their nights go down to five degrees Celsius for several weeks, especially during this winter of 2023. I have a trio here. It's the Zygopetalum Alliance or Zygopetalum grouping that I have. I've got the Murasaki Kamachi, the Zygonesia Murasaki Komachi here to the left. I've got my new Luisendorf that had a rotten pseudobulb, which we cut out. Two new growths were growing. They have ish matured, kind of like. And I've got my Trozy Blue, my first ever Zygo in the back. So I'm just going to pull some out of the way. Because, yeah, I'm not exactly too thrilled about what I see in this pot. But the orchid is alive. She didn't bloom for me this year. Meanwhile, I would sulk as well if I had to deal with my care, my conditions that I can provide. She's growing another new growth. She is fully rooted in the pot. Really, it's only the fact that I have to treat them so harshly out here that they're not doing as well as they could. As long as my orchids stay alive, eventually circumstances may change and I can do them more justice. But for now, it is what it is. But she's alive. New growth. We'll see if that one blooms for us. And here my OG Zygo Trozy Blue did bloom for us on this growth right here. Just a sad little three blooming spike. But again, same story, I will repeat it. They are alive and eventually things might change and we can do better and give them a better care, bring them inside when it gets a little bit too rough. So I'm just going to see what this moss is all about. How are the roots down there? Yeah, the roots underneath are dead so I can take the moss off because I don't want any rot. Ooh, and then we see a shiny, beautiful root right there, which we're gonna be covering up with moss again or maybe Lekka. Every root on a Zygo is precious, so we're not going to risk losing that, letting it dry out too much. Not that it's gonna dry out in these temperatures, but you know, just in case, just in case. We're just gonna cover it up with some Lekka. I just don't want this moss to be all around the pseudobulbs the way it is, very aggressively growing up there. While I like it in the summer, and it is helpful in the winter, it can cause all sorts of issues if I don't pay attention. Now in the back here, it's not that big a deal, because if these were to go, then I could cut them off. I'm just gonna be a bit more careful around the front here, seeing as she is growing me a beautiful new growth. And we wanna protect that. And here's the one that the rotted pseudobulb surgery was dealt with. And that is being absorbed. I hope you can see it because the, even though it's overcast, the light is quite harsh. But you can see there, we've got roots. Look, that root didn't even get affected by the cinnamon that I poured into that section of the bulb that was also rotting. Didn't get affected, but we got roots going into the pot and we've got the start of a new growth as well. So my little Luisendorf, that was a pathetic little thing is actually doing pretty well considering. And you might wonder why I still have the tissue here. That is because the pseudobulb here is loaded with cinnamon. And until I don't take the pseudobulb off, which I have no intention of doing at this point in time, maybe that all wasn't even in focus, but until I don't remove all of this, that little bit of tissue right there helps me to absorb any cinnamon so it doesn't go down into the media and do the worst with the roots that I now have. So eventually, maybe next year, we might see Luisendorf blooms back on the patio. Here's my Melissa Brianne, my little Oncidium. My goodness, I bet she would love it to be much, much warmer, but you know, she lives outside. 
and she has been able to do that for the past four years has always come through has always bloomed for me just make sure that this sheath isn't wet just give some air around the base there we're losing a leaf that's to be expected we've got the two new growths here they're not happy at all but she is in spike now this is not a stress spike so i don't have to interfere here because she has been living outside in my climate since she arrived on the patio. I wanted to test her, let's say, durability. <laughs> and well, she's held on and that's not a problem. So now I'm just leaving her outside all the time. There's probably a spike coming down in here as well. I can see a little shadow. So she blooms for me reliably, despite not having it nice and warm and toasty the way she would prefer to have it. You know, even if it's five degrees and she can handle it, I'm sure she would prefer a minimum of 12. Anyway, she is reliable and I appreciate her for it. Just make sure that my microfibers are damp. Yes, they are, that's wonderful. This is the Oncidium that I still call Oncidium Inse because I got this orchid from Inse's Orchids and ADD. Look at this trooper, go, look at this trooper. Now, I have her outside, not because I don't care about her, but I push my new orchids to the max during the seasons that they are with me for the first time. I only got this orchid last year in 2022. This is my first winter with her. So I'm testing cold tolerance. I know it sounds harsh, but I don't know my orchids well enough when they are new in my collection. This is the best way for me to get to know my orchids. And uh, <clears throat> doesn't seem to care. Three new growths, absolutely fantastic. And yes, she's getting fertilized because she's growing three new growths. She's outside, she gets lots of light and hey, why not encourage it? So fertilizing away. Same with the other ones, by the way, if they're an active growth and they're outside, they're doing something, growing roots, etc. They get fertilized no matter the temperatures. Sorry, I'm just scooting pots around on the top shelf because I want to bring down another one while I talk to you. And this is Krista Erdmann. Now this one I'm keeping on the little bit of a drier cycle. You can see the moss isn't happy. I would like to have more water. But my Erdmann here is just staying damp on the microfiber front because she's not really doing anything except dropping a leaf, which is also normal anyway. We don't even have a sign of spikes yet. This is her first winter with me outside. She's been in my collection for at least three years, I believe. Let me, let me check the label. She has been in my collection 2019, since November 2019. So I've always had her inside. Now I can't put the tag back. That's a great sign, which means she's pot bound. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just fiddle around here because I am not putting that tag away with the conditions we have at the moment. Maybe if I use the support as a guide to get in there. There we go. Yeah, with the conditions we're having, things are blowing a hoolie. It's not happening. Anyway, so I won't say that she is resting in my environment because clearly I do keep the media somewhat damp. But if you were to have this one in your climate where it's nice and somewhat warmer, you would probably be leaving your media on this one a little bit drier until she starts to push a spike, which I'm kind of hoping is going to happen. But if she objects to being outside, there's something bulging right there. But if she objects to being outside and doesn't bloom for us, then you know what? I'm not particularly concerned as long as she stays alive. I know I sound harsh when I say I'm not particularly concerned when there are no blooms, but honestly, keeping the orchids alive is one thing. Not being able to bring them in is the challenge that I have to accept. And as long as they stay alive, if they don't bloom, it's okay. Circumstances one day will change and then everybody gets to be pampered again. But the star of the show is my Oncosteli Wildcat. Golden red star. So we're talking about the star of the show. Yes, and the orchid is facing away from me because I did want the blooms, the spikes to open beautifully and present themselves nicely. Now, is it raining outside? Because I do want to show these to you properly. So let's move to the other side of the trellis and see if we can get some better light. Well, while turning the corner and putting the Onco Stele into some better light, let me just stop right here 
and show you another Oncidium that has to stay outside just because of its size. This is Colmenara Masai Red and oh, she's doing beautiful things again. Look at that. Look at those spikes. And she does this year in, year out. I only had her indoors for her first winter and then she grew so, so fast and so, so big that subsequent winters she has been outside and she does this for me every single year. Gotta love me an orchid that can handle my conditions and still do this, meaning let's head back to our Oncostella wildcat in the better light. So you see, this is where my logic might be, you know, makes sense. She's growing, she's blooming, even though the temperatures are low. Again, I would prefer to have her inside, but as long as I see this happening year in, year out, then I believe the orchid is okay. I may not get a spike that branches the way I did in the first two years while she was in my collection after I rescued her, but you know, it's still a beautiful color. I may also sort of risk a little bit of deformities here. This bloom right here looks a little bit unhappy, but that's one bloom and I have a second spike, which is a first for a, the longest time, seeing as, yes, I rescued her, then I got ahead of myself, got too comfortable with my achievement of having rescued her, and it turns out that I put her back into rescue mode. So after a year and a half of getting her back to recover, I've got a second spike now. That's a first for this orchid, and that's why I'm okay with having her live outside. Ah, just a little bit of sun to end the video. This is awesome. Other orchids that I have outside are winter resters, dendroviums, like the tortilla, the Victoria Regina. I've got my Stanhopia that you can see in the background of some of these shots. Lots of other orchids that can tolerate the outside. These are the ones I would prefer to have inside, but you know, circumstances are such, others need the space more. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Now that the sun is out, but it's not going to last long, I leave you at least on a brighter, brighter frame. <laughs> really appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate your time. And I would appreciate if you would like this video, especially for the orchids that do what they're doing right now, despite the adverse conditions. That would raise my self-esteem tremendously. Thank you. <laughs> Subscribe if you haven't subscribed, seeing as, you know, we still have another two months to go. Things could go wrong. You may not want to miss out. I don't like to explain too much once I've lost an orchid when it comes down the line and things are a distant memory. And then, well, what about da di da And I have to then go back and remember what went wrong during the last two months of the winter. So subscribe and spare me having to explain myself in July when it's nice, warm and toasty. Anywho, <laughs> have yourself a beautiful day. That one condition remains that you stay safe. Take care. Bye. Oh, one orchid <laughs> that should be inside definitely is my CG Roebling, but she is virused and well, it is a tight squeeze indoors and there's no way I'm putting her inside. We'll see what she does. We're following her progress, her decline. We're going to see how she performs having to deal with these conditions. And let me tell you, if something happens, then she will be documented in a separate video. But I just wanted to let you know, I have a warm to hot grower outside dealing with temperatures of five degrees Celsius at night and 13 during the day, but a lot, a lot of light with the exception of the overcast days. Maybe I can give some pointers to anybody that has a Roebling who then has problems with heating or that the heat dropped or something like that and it got cold in the grow space. I'm testing the hardiness to see if I can help anybody out not to have to worry about their Roebling in case of anything happening to the utilities. Not necessarily by choice, <laughs> but you know what? We might as well take the circumstances for what they are and then analyze them and take advantage of the situation, right?